Well, um, good morning. Welcome to the second uh, session of Creative Brain Week. And um, I'm really uh, thrilled I'm doing to that. invite I'm going the same way. I just need to run out. Really yeah, grand. very important people in, in, in Irish life, indeed international life, is uh, Maureen Kennelly, who's the director of the Irish Arts Council, and Kieran Scheuge, who's deputy director general of Science Foundation Ireland. Now, we know that Ireland is, has, is famous for its artistic, particularly literary achievements. And, uh, you know, we've, we've won Nobel Prize in physics and we've several in <laughs> literature. And, um, and Ireland has, has really made an international image for themselves, as, ourselves as a fantastic uh, country of creativity in the arts. However, thanks to the forethought of people relatively recently, my, I've been 20 years now in Ireland, that kind of coincides with Ireland beginning to take science seriously and investing in uh, Science Foundation Ireland, which has really um, had the most remarkable um, success in conjunction with its university and other partners in create, creating a scientific profile for, for Ireland, which is, is probably unprecedented internationally in the, the s steepness of the slope of, of, you know, from a very, quite a low base, very low funding, to, to, a, to an, a time when science is really, uh, Ireland is quite leading uh, in certain areas uh, of, of science and technology. So uh, the, the theme of today's session is that Creativity is actually the skill for the 21st century. That creativity in its broadest sense. And what we have here is the opportunity for this small, well-integrated country with a strong sense of collective confidence and collective identity to bring together the very best of its arts and creativity with its science and its creativity to really um, accelerate this, 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 these incredible achievements even more. So I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome uh, Maureen Kennelly, um, uh, who's going to give us a presentation, and then Kieran will, and then we'll open up to, to questions. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. Good morning, everybody. It's absolutely lovely to be here. Um, I, uh, I wanted to start by just saying very, very quickly uh, a little bit about my background and how I came to be involved in the arts. So, and it's pertinent to where we are here in Trinity College. I grew up in a very small village called Ballylongford in North Kerry. My name is Kennelly, so I share a surname with the wonderful Brendan Kennelly, the, the much uh, beloved and lamented poet. And I guess when I was growing up, um, Brendan was very much at the height of his profile. He was often on the Late Late Show, as lots of people will, will remember. And knowing that Brendan, who was very encouraging of me, who was somebody like lots of teenagers, scribbling away at poetry at the age of 12 and 13, and very much supported too by the fact that I grew up near Listowel Writers Week. Um, but knowing Brendan and knowing about his profile in Ireland and further afield very much normalised the arts for me. And for that, I'm extremely grateful for the fact of growing up in a tiny, tiny village, a couple of hundred people, um, not a huge amount of industry, but the fact that this, a poet of that stature, grew up there um, was a very, very powerful force for me and for many of my peers. So um, I've been working in the arts for about 28 years. Before I took on this role with the Arts Council in April 2020, I was director of Poetry Ireland for six and a half years. And uh, you'll see lots of literature, I hope, threaded through what I'm about to say in the next 10 minutes or so. So I suppose literature is, a, like for many people in Ireland, is a, a huge love of mine. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks to Dominic Campbell and everybody involved in this morning for the opportunity to be here. Um, so I guess we're, we're asked to address how creativity is our biggest asset, how it's going to help us solve daily problems and how it's going to improve our health and well-being. Um, I mentioned Poetry Ireland. When I was um, director of Poetry Ireland towards the latter half of my tenure there, we um, moved into a fantastic building in Parnell Square. 
and our ambition and the ambition of Poetry Ireland, Poetry Ireland continues to be to make a poetry centre, to create the Poetry Ireland centre for people in Ireland and further afield. And so my journey to work every day was to walk up O'Connell Street and into Parnell Square. And Parnell Square is a fascinating part of Dublin. It's 70% of people who live and who occupy the space around Parnell Square. For them, their, their first language isn't English. So it's, it's really emblematic of Ireland as, as we live now. And as I used to go on my journey to work every day, there were two particular lines of poetry that resonated all the time with me. One was Walt Whitman's fantastic line, I contain multitudes from leaves of grass. And the other one was Emily Dickinson's, I dwell in possibility. <clears throat> and it, th those, when I was thinking about preparing remarks for today, those two lines kept coming back to me again and again. It's the fact of the, how incorrigibly plural we are as the poet Louis MacNeice put it, how much there is in us, how fantastically various we are, and the potential to harness that. For me, that's what creativity is about. And back again to, it, it's a, an understanding that I feel I have of creativity that is normalized across every area of Irish life. So it's not just about the arts, but I'd be speaking about the arts t t today to you. Um, so to be affected by art, I feel, is for us to be very much paired back to our essence, the very essence of what makes us human. The purity of thought and of feeling that the finest art can evince in us is a very, very powerful thing. And I once read somebody, I think it was in The New Yorker, say that watching or experiencing a piece of dance that she had made her brain feel clean. And I thought, God, that's, that's a powerful example of what, what the arts can do for us. So we talk about creativity in terms of problem solving and of it being a critical skill in terms of developing solutions to problems and of how it makes us inventive and how it helps us find alternative strategies. And we all know how much we needed to find those alternative strategies in the last two years in particular. And why I believe creativity particularly is a tool for the future is that it, it does help us look anew. It helps us experiment and innovate it helps us cope with adversity, where the, the, the term workaround is one that we've all become very familiar with in, in recent years. It restores us, it gives us reprieve, and it stimulates us. And there's a fantastic essay uh, by the former UN ambassador, Samantha Power. She gave the T.S. Eliot lecture a couple of years back in the Abbey Theatre. And she came up with a very, very good definition of the arts, of the power of the arts, which was to say that the arts have the singular capacity to generate empathy, to educate citizens, to change minds, to build community, and to incite action. And I think something that we observe with many artists and creative thinkers is that they're very, very comfortable with ambiguity, with complexity, and with discomfort. And there's a great um, definition by the Pulitzer Prize winning poet Paul Muldoon about a poem being a disturbing unit, that the fact of reading a poem or experiencing a poem should be to go through it and to be changed by the end of it. Um, and it reminds me very much, I'm sure lots of us here did, uh, studied T.S. Eliot's love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, Do I Dare Disturb the Universe? Here we are, how can we make a difference? What, what is the human condition that we can change the world by the very act of going through it? And again, I won't be quoting poems or po poetry all the time, but um, in thinking about the complexity and the very act of creating that artists do, that facing the blank page every day, Yeats had a fantastic line soon after he won the Nobel, which was, I made it out of a mouthful of air. So it's just lovely to capture that it, I made it out of nothing, effectively. Or Sappho, the Greek poet, talks about mere air, these words, but delicious to hear. And like when we think about the magic, the mystery of art, to think about those things, I have made this out of nothing, is a very, very powerful thing. So for artists, there, those, there are those periods of sitting with their thoughts, ideas, people, situations, exploring, experimenting, sometimes, and not always, resulting in great individual or collaborative work. And sometimes then they're moving on without fully realizing successful outcomes. And that's a crucial part that we have to accept failure as part of this whole process. And again, never has this capacity for change or adaptability been more present nor more important than the last two years. 
there's a great writer that some people might know, I hope, uh, Francois Matarasso, who is a, an arts and community activist based in the UK. And he wrote a very good introductory piece for a catalogue for an organisation whom we support in Kilkenny called the Kilkenny Collective for Arts Talent. And that's where um, artists of all abilities work together to create really powerful collaborative art. They're a fantastic organisation. I'd encourage you to, to go and visit them when you're next in the environs of Kilkenny. But Matarasa wrote that a work of art asks us to be open to another person and that that's the extraordinary offer it makes. There's nothing more difficult, more exhilarating or more important. And he says that when we make art, we're trying to commun communicate what gives meaning to our experience of being alive. And I want to talk about, to, for us to reflect on creativity, not just being on behalf of the creator, it's also on behalf of the person who's experienced the, the piece of art, the audience member. So in experiencing that piece of art, we're communicating back to the creator and then we're communicating to each other in the hope of being understood and recognized. And it is that aspect of curiosity as well. It's allowing us to ask questions of each other, to try and get over that ambiguity. And that's where creativity really scores. And again, I think that this is what the arts did to glorious effect during COVID. It enabled us as individuals and also as communities to come together and it created a very strong sense, sense of social cohesion at a time when social distancing obviously prevented us from doing so. But I guess long before the pandemic, artists and creators have utilized their skills in unpredictable contexts and they've worked in areas, and obviously in the coming week you'll hear lots about this, working in areas such as neurodiversity, mental health, creative aging, death and dying, and in many, many community, human and cultural rights contexts. And it's fantastic to see the different disciplines that we're collapsing the boundaries between those that we're now we're fully realizing how much we can learn from each other and how much creativity is straddling all those different disciplines. And in the Arts Council, we very much want to work across these sectors um, and we work with a range of fantastic organisations like Age and Opportunity and the, the Waterford Healing Arts Trust and, and, and a whole assemblage of others. Um, and we're also involved in ongoing work in the area of arts and health, working with colleagues in the HSC, in the Department of Health and through the Creative Ireland programme. And I know that very, very interesting outcomes are going to come through that work. But I suppose it's not about just about creativity in the utilitarian sense, it's also the intrinsic value of the arts and the inherent generosity of creative expression and the sharing of work. And I wanted to refer very briefly, there was a major report produced by the Arts and Humanities Council in the UK in late 2020. And that presented the outcomes of assessing over 70 original pieces of work. An important conclusion from that research was that one of the most significant ways arts and culture activity and engagement brings value to both individuals and society is by creating the conditions for change. And the report refer refers to a whole slew of spillover effects that derive from this, including an openness, a space for experimentation, and risk-taking at the personal, social, and economic level an ability to reflect in a safer and less direct way on personal community and societal challenges and much else besides. And that these changes may often involve significant personal transformations, improved self-understanding, a breaking of routine ways of thinking, and they may also affect how we relate to others through inc increased empathy. And I think that empathy is something that we're all so much more aware of particularly from the last two years during the pandemic, that ability, that experience of thinking inside each other's skins, of being able to empathize and actually think, what is this person going through? I wanted to very quickly reflect on the fact that creativity isn't a spark, it's often a slog. And that's why it's so important that we, we recognize the work that goes into making a piece of art. A masterpiece is not created overnight. Um, it's honed, a friend of mine often says that all writing is actually rewriting and it's about the, the honing of that that really makes the great creators, the great 
artists, the great thinkers that actually show us a way and improve our own self-understanding. And it is about that, that willingness to take on that work uh, to create something that's beautiful, desirable, and useful. Um, and it, you know, just to emphasize again, and I suppose in the coming weeks, the Minister for the Arts and Culture will be announcing a pilot program around the basic income for artists. And that's why this is so important that we acknowledge the place of artists in our society, the amount of work that goes into it and why we need to support them. And luckily, the Arts Council is in a happy place in terms of massively increased funding from government. We've gone from 75 million in 2019 to our current level of 130 million. It's a historic level of funding. It still doesn't get us near enough to our European colleagues, but it's a fantastic advance. So, and that's why it is so important that we work with other, other disciplines in terms of saying, this is why creativity is so important to sh in, in terms of shaping a successful Irish society. Um, I wanted to finally reflect just on um, a few pieces of, of, of prose that I have. Um, I'm kind of like lots of people, I'm sure, a bit of a magpie. You're, you're picking up things that you read that, that affect everything that you think about. And John Banville, the novelist, says, everything you do influences everything you do. And there's a lovely synergy when everything you, you read or hear about you know, all contributes to, to your thinking about the world. Um, but Elizabeth Strout is an American writer who, again, I'm sure is known to, to many people here. And um, there were two pieces that I want to particularly reflect on which re relate to this, this um, piece about empathy and how creativity improves our levels of empathy. So um, she's a great respecter of mysteries, particularly her own, and she has said that her great driving force as a writer is to try to find out what it feels like to be another person. She refers to a key realisation early on. It came to me that I was never going to see from anybody else's point of view except my own for my whole life. Isn't that amazing? I wouldn't know whether the red they were seeing was the red I was seeing, let alone whether their happiness felt like my happiness. I still can't get over that. And I think that's absolutely powerful. It just makes the case for this is why we have millions of artists in the world to help us make sense, because trying to very much help us understand what it is to be human in the world. And then there was a fantastic interview between Elizabeth Strout and Elena Ferrante, the Italian novelist who wrote My Brilliant Friend and uh, author of the Neapolitan novels, which are much loved by millions of people throughout the world. And there's, uh, this, this appeared in The Guardian just last Saturday, I think. And I want you to, to just quote it. It's, it's not terribly long now, but it, Elena Ferrante is explaining to Elizabeth Strout how she came to be a writer. So she says... In fact, like you, I felt different as a child. I was nearly mute or expressed myself in timid monosyllables. But then my moment arrived and it seemed to me that I lowered a bucket into my head and pulled out words. The words carried a story with them. The more the story advanced and the wilder the pace of the bucket as it went up and down, bringing me pleasure and, and unease, the more enthralled the other children were. But was I really different? No. Just think of when, in ordinary conversation, we proceed in disjointed phrases, either weighing our words or using an ironic tone that drives out a melodramatic one. Then, unexpectedly, suddenly, something breaks through the margins and speech becomes a flood, liberating, moving, passionate, fierce, until we're embarrassed. We're sorry. We say, I don't know. Something got into me. Well, that's something. An eye crouching in our brain grabs us and tears us away from a prudent or calculating eye, dragging us along, imposing its rhythm. It's a common experience for us all. We know it, whether we're writers or not. And in terms of that explaining of the voice in the head, the, the, the impulse, the, um, and, and, and there's such a, a wonderful sense of of empathy, the, the non-specialness in a way of being an artist, to so say, you know, the, the bucket dragging the words out, out, of the, out of the brain. So I wanted to, to finally end by saying that creativity for me is also very much centred about the questions that we ask ourselves and that help us 
change and that how strongly I feel that we're not saddled with the certainties of the past, particularly because of the experience of the pandemic, that w our creative thinking is going to allow us to be far more open to each other. I like to think now that society is far more porous and that we're going to be able to work together in a far more collaborative way in terms of being creative. So creative allows us to do that and our lives are immeasurably improved by it. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Maureen. And uh, lots of thoughts and questions, but I think without, we'd love to hear Kieran's perspective and then we can open it up to, to discussion. Right, good morning everybody. And um, I'm delighted to be here with you all today. Particularly delighted to be looking at real humans for a change. Um, <laughs> after two years of looking at a screen and talking to myself and wondering, was there actually anybody on the other side listening? At least I know there's a small captive audience who can't escape without me noticing. Um, I'm also delighted to be here at the start of Creative Brain Week and I want to congratulate everybody who is part of this thing and for a fantastic initiative. This is really important stuff and it's, you know, I'm delighted to see that we are having these conversations about the creative brains and what they mean and how this is going to work. The one thing I am regretting though is I'm kind of regretting going after Maureen. That's a <laughs> tough act to follow. Um, so I don't have the degree of uh, poetry or artistic literature to quote that she would have. In fact, as I was listening to Maureen, I was thinking the only thing I'm going to quote is something like Monty Python and say, and now for something completely different. <laughs> <laughs> so which is probably what I'm going to be doing over the next little while. What I want to address, I want to talk about, is three kind of theses about why I think creativity is really the skill of the future. So here's the three things I want to talk about. Okay, let's see if this clicker is going to work for me in the way it's supposed to. Three theses. All right, the first one here is this. Creativity is, in fact, the cornerstone of our success as a species. Second thing is, Creativity and science are intrinsically linked. So Maureen has spoken about a lot of topics there. I look forward to talking about them afterwards. You know, that curiosity that exists in the arts. It's a core element of the sciences as well. And the third thesis I want to try and prove this morning is science will become more creatively accessible, which is a term I'm going to try and explain over the next few minutes what I mean about that. So let's go and have a go and see if I can get through these in the 10 minutes or so to talk to you about it. Right, creativity. I believe creativity is our species' secret sauce. So let me start by introducing this poor character, Neanderthal Man. Neanderthal Man was wandering around about 400,000 years ago to 40,000 years ago, and minding his own business, hunting and gathering all over Europe and Asia. He was very successful. That's a long period of time, you know, pretty much 400 or 350,000 years he was knocking around there. And he had a large brain. Interesting just to note, keep that in mind. Neanderthal Man had a fairly large brain, we think. Along comes this character. Now, we diverged from a common ancestor sometime in the past, but while the Andertal man was spreading around Europe and Asia, we, Homo sapiens, were in Africa. Again, hunting and gathering, living our best lives, watching Netflix, whatever else we were doing at that time, for long periods of time. So 300,000 years, you know, knocking around over there. We have a sort of middle-of-the-range size brain, interestingly. You know, ours is about 1400 cc, theirs is, you know, considerably bigger. But then something strange happened. Right. And we don't quite know why, but about 65,000 years ago, there's a thing called the Great Leap Forward. And this is where all of a sudden, as a species, we can see it in the artifacts, all of a sudden as a species, for some reason, we developed arts, we developed creativity, we developed tools, weapons, projectile weaponry in particular. Right? We, eject, we developed storytelling and jewellery that we could adorn our bodies with. We developed morals and laws and all kinds of things suddenly changed. Now, we don't quite know why. What brought this about? Uh, there's some theories abound that this is because actually modern humans were not quite the same as the ones from 300,000 years ago. There's an evolutionary step. There's other theories that we reached a critical mass of maybe you know, enough of us had, had existed there. Uh, we reached this critical mass, and then we could invest more of our species' time and effort in these things. But whatever happened, this was a major change. We now were creating. Right? We became a creative species. And around then, we started wandering up out of Africa in towards Europe. And of course, eventually, Harry met Sally about 45,000 years ago, and Neanderthals met Homo sapiens. And what you'll see is, 45,000 years ago, we met them, and after they'd been wandering around there, fine, for 350,000 years or so, within a couple of thousand years of in interacting with us, they were gone. All of them. Now, there's a bunch of theories about this. You know, there's one theory is that, in fact, we hunted them to oblivion. The other is, because of our creativity, we were much more able to compete. Right? We were able to take the resources. We were able to deal with any climatic or other changes that happened more effectively. And, of course, the other theory is that we were slightly less discerning in our breeding practices, and, as a result, 
all of us here today have about 2 or 3% uh, Neanderthal uh, DNA in us, so we outbred them to some extent, or interbred. But either way, there's something about our species that meant that our creativity and our ability to adapt made us incredibly successful. And now, we're the only hominids left. Right? We took over completely. So it's definitely been our secret sauce. It's definitely the thing that changed. You can see it in the historical records. But now let's step forward a little bit. I want to talk about these two characters. Right? Copernicus and Galileo. Well-known guys from history. These guys basically came up with the idea that, in fact, the Earth wasn't the center of everything. We weren't geocentric. In fact, they were talking about heliocentricity. The reason I choose these guys is because I want to sort of just use that as an explanation about how you have to be very creative and imaginative in the sciences to take that leap forward. If you think about it at the time, the wisdom at the time, the known facts at the time, were written in the Bible, right? This is the center, this is the universe, this is the world that we stand on. It's clearly not moving, right? All of us can see it's not moving, it's quite stable. And yet these guys were able to do their observations and project and think outside of that and say, actually, something's different, it's not quite adding up. And that was the kind of the key to, to the sciences. That's what I mean by the creativity and the ability to step out of your mind and think, actually, maybe it's kind of different. Maybe we are this spinning ball that's spinning around the sun. And maybe all the conventional wisdoms and the cancel culture of the time is not correct. And that's what these guys were expounding upon. They basically took themselves out, made that leap, looked at the theories and the mathematics and the observations and joined it up, but could make that leap to say this is quite different. Now, Copernicus was a little bit smarter than Galileo, incidentally, because Copernicus basically wrote it in Latin, made it in very difficult to understand language, and only published the last page on his deathbed. Galileo, on the other hand, published a lot earlier and ended up in prison for the rest of his life, pretty much. So, you know, he didn't quite think that through when he went against the conventional wisdom 100 years later, but the two gentlemen in question, they were confirmed in their belief that they could just step outside and imagine and create something else. So let me move on to a little bit more towards the second thesis here. Oh, I'm sorry, no, I like this guy. And this particular quote, I'm going to talk about Einstein quite a bit over the next little while. And one thing he talks about is intelligence, right? It's not about knowledge, it's about imagination. And Einstein's notorious for that. In his own writings and his own things later on about how he came up with his own concepts, he talked about imagination being much more important. In fact, for Einstein and his special theory of relativity, and everyone knows Einstein for his E equals MC squared equations, that wasn't really his thing. Actually, his thing was imagination. Right, so special theory of relativity came because Einstein imagined himself speeding along, riding on a light beam. Right? And what would happen if he caught up with a light beam? What would it look like in the ether, which was the then sort of understood theories at the time, was like we live in an ether and everything moves in an ether. So what happens if I'm traveling at a light beam? Do I catch up with the light beam? What happens to the waves? He pictures all this in his head. He thinks in pictures. He imagines. Right? And imagination is basically, and creativity is basically, imagination turned into something. And so that's what he does. He imagines these things. He imagines these light beams. He imagines this travel. And then he turns into a special theory of relativity, and he figures it out from there. And he was a big fan of this ability to imagine outside of his own sort of, sort of box that he would in, and not just stick to the rigors of mathematics. The other thing is, we use this term all the time. You know, something is more of an art than a science. And sometimes I would argue that science is more of an art than a science. Right? You have to think of it in those terms. Many of the scientists throughout the world were, actually throughout our history, have been artists of one kind or another. And we forget this. For some strange reason, we have decided that the art forms and the sciences are something completely different. You know, I was a scientist here in Trinity many years ago. You look at Trinity, we have like a sort of an arts end and a science end. We, just, we have this split. Sometimes it's in our heads and sometimes it's actually a physical split. And so here's the thing about it. Most of our really great scientists don't have that split, right? The early ones, if you look at Leonardo, everybody knows about Leonardo da Vinci. He was a sculptor and a painter and an inventor, and he came up with all kinds of different things, but he was a scientist. If you think about the term PhD, right? It's a doctor of philosophy. It's a thinker. It's somebody who values knowledge. And it's not just a scientist or one thing or another. It's the concept of knowledge. And some reason in our species, we've just decided these things are two different things and never the twain shall meet. And I don't quite know why, and it's not very constructive. But look at these guys. Even Einstein that I was talking about earlier on, well, he was a musician, right? He played the violin. And look at all these other ones, poet poets and writers and sculptors and artists of one form or another. And there's hosts more that I couldn't quite fit into a slide just to give you as examples. You know, there's many of them were in the past often artists who would then use their artistic capability to draw what they would see. And that could be neurons, or that could be natural science, or butterflies, whatever else it was going to be. Right? Those things were joined up. And the interesting thing about the arts is they teach you to see things differently. They teach you to look and see, and not just assume what's coming in. 
So it's that idea of, you know, a scientist also has to have that creativity and as well as that, that imagination, that concept of trying to see things differently. That curiosity, innate curiosity that drives an artist to paint something in a different way drives a scientist in the same way. So my second thesis is these things should not be separated. They are intrinsically linked. But here's where things start to get really interesting. The future. You see, we have a lot of problems facing us right now. I mean, we've dealt with a pandemic, sort of. Uh, that's why we're all sort of, you know, still learning to so click that forward. We're still learning to be here in a sort of a scattered form. Right? But we have many more challenges coming to us as a species. Right? We know the climate is a major challenge that needs to be dealt with, and there will be more. And I'm an inherently an optimist. I'm absolutely convinced we'll fix these things. But there's a couple of things that are going to change. One of the things is, I think we have kept people away, the artistic, creative side. We, you know, with children in school, we say, oh, you're quite artistic. You might want to be an artist or a writer or something. And somebody else goes, oh, you're good at mathematics. You can be a scientist. Right? And we, send, we tend to split that way. We shouldn't. And the thing is, mathematics, it kind of is the pure underlying language of science. Right? And it has a very strong capability and power in there. If you're trying to do some really complex mathematics, sometimes you'll find mathematicians or scientists thinking in n-dimensional space. Now try and imagine that, you know, one dimensions, two dimensions, three dimensions, n dimensions, what does that even look like? I have no idea. But mathematically you can create n dimensions and use that as constructs to actually make theories and build things up. And that tends to put some people off from an artistic perspective or even other just different thinkers. Tend to shy away from the sciences sometimes because we just say you have to be really good at mathematics. It's the only way to prove a theory. It's all statistics and mathematics and that's really hard stuff and t tends to put people off. And in schools especially, the young children coming up, they tend to shy away because it's like it's maths and it's hard and we do that and we shouldn't. Especially because what's going to change. And the term is augmented intelligence. So everybody I'm sure has heard of artificial intelligence. So that's where the computers are getting really, really good and all these algorithms are looking at things and they're figuring it out for us and they're able to do machine learning and big data and analytics and do all this kind of stuff and that's great. Augmented intelligence is where mankind meets machine. Where the machine's capabilities and ours can be complementary where I argue that we can make science more creatively accessible. So you can be much more creative and imaginative and let the machine do some of the work that sometimes puts people off the sciences. Machines, on the other hand, the algorithms, so far, they struggle with that creative, intuitive step that we can kind of naturally do. Right? Our brains are incredibly powerful. I was looking at it at one point, if you in terms of petaflops of a brain, right? our brains in terms of petaflops, the number of operations they can do compared to a supercomputer, are orders of magnitude, about six orders of magnitude, it's like thousands of times more powerful than the best supercomputer. And yet a supercomputer is using megawatts of power, and our brain uses 20 watts. It is an incredibly efficient, powerful entity that we cannot replicate, and it has this ability to intuit, to leap, to these creative uh, leaps forward that machines can't do. The future for us is where we have that augmented uh, intelligence, where our capabilities are joined to those of the machine, and we can solve problems in new ways. By leveraging on this creativity of ours and our imagination, the problems that we're going to face are problems that we can solve. And I'm really optimistic about our ability to do that, because science and creativity will be much more intrinsically linked. And that's a very good picture for the future. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Kieran, and thank you, Maureen. What a thought-provoking pair of talks. So, I am. Um, there was. We've got a Nick Johnson's our Beckett scholar here. Um, many several years ago, there was a big Beckett exhibition in the of his notebooks, which are in Trinity College Library, some of them, and there was an exhibition of them. And I remember being utterly transfixed by his notebooks and his handwriting, because Kieran, they looked more like a mathematics notebook than they did like um, any piece of literature. His, they were geometric. There was scarcely any words in, <laughs> in his notebooks. And it's just hearing both of you speak, you know, it's, there is such a profound truth in the underlying mental processes that are going on in science and arts. And we've only begun to scrape the, 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 the surface of that. And, and you know, what you were saying, Kieran, about augmented intelligence, the idea that the intuitive artistic vision sometimes that's 
that cannot be expressed in words sometimes, that that could somehow be, uh, I wouldn't say weaponized, that's a terrible word, but that, that, you, that, that could be extended, you know, the, 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 the mathematical tools become available and, and these to, to, to artists. And my goodness, what a flourishing of human creativity. There is that possibility. So, so um, <clears throat> Maureen, it's, it's, it's intriguing um, what you were... I, I, I do think arts, the arts practices, people have come, through, during pandemic particularly, the, the government, among others, has come to realise how profoundly central to giving meaning in human life the arts are. Is that, is, is, have you seen that kind of change? <clears throat> yeah, I, I certainly think there has been. Um, we used to use the Joni Mitchell line, <clears throat> I can't remember which song title it's from, but you don't know what you've got till it's gone, you know, in terms of when the pandemic happened and, and the extremely abrupt shutdown that, you know, gigs, everything, live performance was suddenly gone and that people really missed it so and and that it was a real joining together of both artists were saying well our livelihoods are just absolutely obliterated and the audience was saying similarly my my connection to myself is actually very very affected by this you know that people realized it, it wasn't just about going to a gig or a poetry reading or a concert it was about me communing communing with others and that kind of collective feeling that, that people really, really lost. They lost it obviously in other parts of, of their lives as well, sport and, and all other parts. But I think it, that power of the arts to connect us to ourselves and to each other was rammed home by the very fact of it going. You know, So not that we want to be looking for silver linings, but I suppose the pandemic has helped us to an understanding and has helped people across government. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me, it became after a few months, it became very clear that not alone the Minister for the Arts, but the Taoiseach and the Taunasha would mention the arts and culture very regularly in their, um, in their speeches and so on, and acknowledging this, this has been desperately affected. Um, so th it is about that kind of clear understanding. It's, it's to Kieran's point, you know, like, are, are we... Are we finally moving away from, you know, those kind of tropes where, oh, you've got to be good at honours maths to do science or, you know, those kind of just things that we've clung to, you know, um, as kind of lazy assumptions that we make about ourselves. Um, and are we, are we heading towards an understanding of just the shared aspects of curiosity, of problem solving, you know, like what you say about Beckett, there he is, he, he's solving or he's trying to help us solve a problem about what it is to be human, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. So following on that, Kieran, I mean, uh, you were lamenting the, the different paths the science and arts have taken, the, the fact that we're, <laughs> we're not populated with enormous numbers of Leonardos, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Although we are, if what you're saying is there's plenty of scientists with, with that and, and vice versa. How do, you, how do you see the future of arts and science going forward to, to repair that division? What's, what's the kind of architecture of that? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting one to think about because the challenge is, you know, science as it's moving forward, some of it's become so big, right? So some of the things are so complex. We, we talk and we look at some of the, the productivity of scientists, <clears throat> and it seems to be almost going down because the scale of what we're trying to solve is getting bigger. You know, the, we're getting deeper and lower into be it particle physics or out into the cosmos. And so it takes more and more people, more and more time and more complex things to get there. So one of the reasons why we don't have the Leonardo's who are sort of broader is because we've had to get into more and more specialization. That's part of the challenge of the, of the sciences and anything else. Um, but what I was taking with what Maureen talked about there is it's that innate curiosity, right? That's the fundamentals behind what drives a scientist. It's that curiosity to understand why is it like that, you know, what drives that behavior. Um, and anything actually that we can do to sort of get that curiosity driven in another way, um, 
you know, the example of Jesus, there's so many st- things that we take for granted. You know, we look up and go, the sky is blue, I wonder why is it blue, but we don't really think about it, it just is. And, you know, things are different colours. Um, and that ability to actually ask that question, children have it inherently, right? But we lose it as adults. And, you know, bringing the arts in and that ability to drive curiosity and actually <coughs> encourage scientists and enable scientists to think of it in other ways, because it's just the assumptions, the fact that we've just assumed this is conventional wisdom and how it is. <coughs> Using the arts and drawing them in to encourage scientists to think differently about their, th- their, sort of their research in their areas of expertise and actually just ask that almost childlike curious question will be the thing that'll give us those leap forwards in the new advances yeah mm. it is that like sir just to say that sense of wonder mm. um that that it sparks there's a, a theater company for children based in the west of ireland whom we support branner theater company and uh, in their latest strategic plan, they talk about um, wonderful, spelling it F-U-L-L. You know, we want to create a world full of wonder. And that's, we can do that both through the arts and through science. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I got an, inc- you know, I, I can remember you know, myself, you know, you know, and I still have it to some extent, that, that sense of, Sheer excitement. No, I'm not doing the research. I'm doing it in collaboration with other people. But that sense of discovering something new about the world—that that, that it feels like again you're part of something that's not that's external to yourself. Almost you're being you're being taken along by this flow, and it seems to be almost very very similar. Not that I have any great creative um, you know talents, but. I, I occasionally had that glimmering of what it's like to feel your the poem coming to you, and yeah. you had that sense of Ferranti saying, you know, it's, it's, something came in. To yeah. You. So it's that sense of, of of being a vehicle. Yeah. Um, and and if you feel like a vehicle, <coughs> and I guess the threats to that one of the threats to that is functionality. We all, you know, there's so many. Uh, my, my son works now in a company on quantum computing, but when he, and he says, his, his annual assessment, they said, we want you to spend more time thinking mm-hmm. and not worried about delivering so much. Um, and that, that's been, in a university these days, that's very, very difficult yeah. thing because the pressure is on to, to raise grants to, and, and, and it's, it, the, the that that kind of freedom to to really exercise that is 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 there, and I guess there must be similar similar pressures of functionality in the arts. How do you make a living? How do you yeah. how do you br- create a brand, you know, for yourself? Um, so I, I'm just wondering this the, these traps that can, I suspect inhibit creativity, mm. the functionality that you know the the, the kind of the the, 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 you know, the advancement the careerism. How do, you, how do you protect that feeling of something coming into me, of being that vehicle? How do you, how do you protect it both yeah. in the arts and the science? I, I mentioned the, the new basic income for the arts, which will be a, a pilot scheme. And I mean, and say in the Arts Council, we, we fund both organisations and then individual artists, primarily through something we call a bursary scheme. And we describe that as being time to think to, to create the space for an artist, because it's very much like you're saying, you know, somebody's labouring under the pressures of application forms, a presentation of their work. You know, we, we've got to really invest in artists in, in terms of saying, this is your time to create. And we know it's complex and difficult and that it can't be mag- magicked up and that it involves actual hard slog. slog and, and graft and experimentation and failure and all those... The, all those phases of fine honing and tuning and editing that, that people have to go through. You know, if, if we want to create the next generation of Heaney's and Ivan Bolans and Martin Hayes and so on, we've got to absolutely invest in it. And I think we all know that now. Um, but it, 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 back to your point, when, you, when you're talking about, you know, that a poem or a piece of art coming through me, Michael Longley has said, if I knew where poems came from, I'd go there. <laughs> so, you know, there is that, that mystery Mm. You know, and, and people do talk about the poem came through me and that can sound a bit lofty and a bit, but, but actually it is that feeling of I'm an instrument and this is, this is actually travelling through me. And, you know, luckily if we can invest in people, they can actually 
make it so that the rest of us can share it. And I mean, that's, that's an incredibly powerful thing. I was lucky enough to be at the, um, a performance on Thursday night in the National Concert Hall by the Irish Chamber Orchestra, and the leader was a Norwegian composer and violinist, and he is a really charismatic, brilliant, brilliant performer and conductor. But the last piece he played, uh, he had the orchestra play, was by a Ukrainian composer, and it was an incredibly powerful piece. And at the end of the piece, the, the moment was held for about 30 seconds. There was complete silence, and you could feel that the 300 of us there were all going through something remarkable together. So it's just, you know, how do we just make sure that we continue to invest in that so that future generations and you know because it is it, it's a hard life and there are many other competing demands but i think that sense of collaboration with different disciplines helps us understand why it's so important and helps us make the argument more widely about why it needs investment a moment like that can can last a lifetime can't mm. it yeah it can change yeah and and, and, and being able to create something like that particularly between people what what an what an achievement and and um so i mean with the thing about curiosity here and you were saying and this this feeling of being impelled it contains its own meaning it's self-justifying i mean you don't have to say well if you're in that being driven by that whatever it is there's no sense when you're saying, why am I doing that, or what's the point? Mm. That question becomes irrelevant. And so in terms of dealing with the incredible changes that people facing people in technology and climate and everything, to, to have this domain of life, whether it's in science or in arts or in some combination, where you feel there is this meaningful activity that's per that, that has its own purpose, I mean, would, you, would you wish anything more... For your child, children to have that, to, to have access to that. You know, the, the funny thing about it is you talk about you know, the, the pressures in the universities and the lack of thinking time and stuff. I think that's everywhere. Right? Yeah. Like the problem is our lives, I doubt there's anybody who sort of sits around and goes, I'm not busy. Right? And I think the, the challenge we've got here is busyness, which is our new sort of pandemic kind of form, but busyness is the enemy of creativity. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. We're so busy the whole time, we're so caught up in stuff, there's no time to step back and think, and I find it in every walk of life. So scientists have it, and I'm sure artists have it, and I'm sure business people have it, we have it in every walk of life. And when you have that, think about the greatest thinkers and philosophers, they will sit back, they'll think, they'll just they'll look at nature, they'll be inherently curious and have the time to explore that curiosity. We don't. So strangely, for all these wonderful technologies and wonderful things, you know, our brains have been getting smaller, strangely, and especially in the last couple of thousand years, which is unusual in terms of the speed at which it's happened. I also worry that every time I pick up an iPhone, it gets smaller as well, that you kind of just really sort of <laughs> constraining it right down. And I think that's part of it. We bring in this busyness. We have instant access to everything. And we just need to have time to stop. Right? It's very interesting you say that. The, um, the ESRI do the, did, have been doing since through the pandemic this two weekly. Um, Sam survey of people's behaviour, and they did a um, they did a two weeks just before the 22nd of January when they released they relaxed some of the regulations, yeah. and then afterwards they were able to compare, and they found a drop in well-being coinciding with the re re relaxation of regulations, and it, also that the survey showed you know, what are the what are the good things, uh, what are the positives of the pandemic and uh, including the positives was not having to socialize so much <laughs> okay so speaking exactly to what you were saying we get caught up in so many wheels of, of habit even the things that are supposed to be fun mm -hmm. and we create duties for ourselves that inhibit this sense of wonder this, this access to this thing you were talking about, Maureen. And um, so I hope we don't lose that glimmering we had during the pandemic. Of maybe yeah, There was a, a great line somebody came out with yeah. when the pandemic started. They said, you know, introverts have been training for this their whole lives. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, there was, uh, if you were fortunate enough not to be, you know, suffer economically too much yeah. from, from this, there's a lot of people actually 
had a good lockdown, you know. Mm. A lot of people, if you're on your own, if you're isolated, if your business was gone, it wasn't a good lockdown. So it was, but it was a very much, as you say, some people benefited a lot, some people suffered a huge amount, yeah. Um, so can I just ask um, both of you to, I mean, we were facing exponential, literally exponential change, the technological change. If, if you just look back the last, 20 years, the technologies we have. What, what's the world going to, I'm asking you to be futurologist both, what's the world going to look like in terms of, uh, and you're an optimist, Kieran, and Maureen, I sense you are as well, of, of, of how we're, uh, where we're going, uh, say, in 10 or 20 years' time in terms of this, uh, the, the realm of creativity and, and, and well-being and, 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 and human human survival, if you like. After you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we are, I am an optimist, and in the Arts Council, we're, we're optimistic by nature too, I think. Um, soon we're going to be launching our spatial policy, and that's whereby we want people in every part of Ireland to have access to the arts, no matter who they are, what they work at, where they live, what, what their background is. And it should also just say that, that our equality, human rights and diversity policy is, is embedded in every single thing that we do as well in the Arts Council. Um, so our vision in 10, 20 years would be that you'd have a civic force field in Ireland. That it would almost, the arts would be like kind of power stations um, springing up everywhere that, you know, you'd look at a map of Ireland and you would say, gosh, there's an art centre there, or there's a festival there. Or, currently, there's reasonably good provision, but our vision in about 20 years time is that if you were growing up in, you know, Strokestown, you said, I'm really interested in ballet, that you would have a pathway to think a career as a ballet dancer is actually something that's within my reach. Um, and that we would be working far more closely with other disciplines, you know, and, and there's really encouraging growth in that, I think, you know, um, like health, science, obviously, uh, sport, all the, the industry, <clears throat> and that there would be a far greater understanding of the power of what the arts can bring us. Fantastic. And Kira? Oh, that's a big question you're asking. <laughs> it really is. You know, and I, and I, I read a lot of material that what futurists create, and they sort of are out to 65 years from now and beyond, and it ranges from the dystopian to the utopian. There's a wide range. So being the optimist, I would be more inclined to go with the utopian route. Um, I think there is this thing I'm talking about, the accessibility of science, you know, getting more people into it so it's not so exclusive. I think we will be able to do that. And I think that the advent of, some people really fear artificial intelligence and the machines and the rise of the machines and, you know, the, the cyborgs and the guys who keep telling us that they'll be back. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I don't to the same extent. You know, we, we have the ability to own this and control this and embrace this and make it work for us. And that's our job as a species. We've always stayed ahead of these big challenges. We've always managed to do that. So I'm optimistic that we'll do it. I'm optimistic that we'll make it work for us. And I'm optimistic that we will use our big, amazing, creative brains to solve the big challenges that are ahead of us. You know, and there's some things, 5, 10, 20 years down the road, you can see you know, the big breakthroughs re recently in fusion power, where we'd have clean, unlimitless energy, you know, advanced medicines, where we're actually going to be able to have almost perfect medicine. You can cure almost anything. Those things are coming around. And I think there will be a, a period now where we get that accessibility of science and we combine ourselves in such a way that we will actually solve the big, pro big problems and create a fantastic world for ourselves, but only if we embrace it in a very open, sort of inclusive manner. God, you should, should be prescribed on the National Health Service. <laughs> 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 um, could I, we've got five more minutes. Can we open up to any comments or questions uh, from the audience? Nic Nicholas, yeah. This can't just one, two, three, four, <laughs> zero. Zero. <laughs> and I, I thought it might be the case, but it, it's so it's it's so insightful to hear the combination of perspectives there. And I know you both dispense funds uh, to you know one to artists, one to scientists, and kind of never the twain shall meet. You referred to this two worlds discourse. Are there actual models by which you think that some of that fusion could occur? Could that only be through universities or through specific projects? Something like this seems to open that door that there could be a conversation uh, between these sectors that, that 
thank you, sorry, um, that integrates uh, to some extent more, more strongly and, and, that, and that really does leverage the potential that you're discussing. Do you want to go, shall I? Well, I, absolutely, yes. I think that, you know, it, it, it's um, a conversation that, that should end up uh, progressing to whereby, you know, as you say, we're, we're both agencies that disperse funds and, um, you know, th there's some activity going on now in terms of um, artists, some artists and residency posts, but I have a feeling that with, with a bit of combined constructive thinking, they're, they're very, very interesting programmes that we could yeah, and generate. I'll, I'll yeah. build on that and just say, you know, we learned something from, from COVID. Um, <clears throat> And that is, you know, as we were sort of working with other agencies, typically the science funding agencies, to try and put together what we call our rapid response call, we found that there was a much more, not just interdisciplinary, but that whole transdisciplinary approach to solving the challenge. We were talking to people that we often wouldn't have talked to in the past who were coming just to say, we want to help solve this problem. It was an incredible period in some ways where people suddenly came out from all over the place and said, they had one simple question, how can I help? Mm -hmm. right? From all walks of life and in a way that we hadn't experienced before. So that's, you know, we have to look for the silver linings out of what has been a tough period, and that's probably one of them. Alejandro. Uh, thank you very much for the discussion, it's been fantastic. Uh, I've, I've been picking up on the idea of uh, creativity in the arts, creativity in science, but I've been looking around the, the photos out there today, while well, they're an artistic representation, they depict creativity in survival. So a lot of the photos there depict people with different um, economic situations using creativity to solve their problems, fix up a bed, uh, haul water on a donkey with self-made ba uh, wicker baskets. And that is also an impressive aspect of creativity. Right? So how do we, as a society, advance all of these three creative elements together and not forget about those who are doing creativity for survival rather than for artistic representation or scientific furthering? Yeah, um, I, I, I think that's, that's a great question. Um, it's, it's back to the problem solving thing and, you know, how we regard artists that they, many are addressing the problems of our day. So cli climate change obviously being, I suppose, be, being the preeminent one, but artists are, you know, there are so many of them are activists and looking at the geopolitical situation, which, which obviously is partic particularly um, current right now, it is by acknowledging what artists do, so at, at coming to a better understanding and obviously having the investment there to, to fund artists to, you know, and, and there are companies and organizations who, whose work, you know, I, I gave the example of the Irish Chain Works the other night <clears throat> and what an impact that had on people, but there are organizations and artists who more literally, de literally deal with the problems of our day and I think it's by us nurturing those artists making sure that we support them to question that that that's very much they're there to question the the orthodoxies of the day and to say how can we create a better world I'd add a bit on that to say that you know knowledge has never been so accessible as well you know it's everybody has access to a vast array of knowledge that we wouldn't have had as easily in the past. Now, that accessibility to knowledge, you know, there's a great line some use about knowledge made useful, um, and it can be made useful at all levels. Um, but actually, access to knowledge, I think, is something that is really going to change our sort of democratic approach to how we evolve our species. Two, two last questions, Magda and then Leonard. And I just have one from, oh, I, I have one from the online participants oh, as well. Yes. So yeah, just great. acknowledge our online okay. participants. Yeah. Um, Magda. Thank you. Uh, this is a wonderful conversation. Um, I'm a dance artist. I work in the community with people living with dementia. And I, w I was struck by something that you mentioned, Karen, of this pandemic of, of speed, of lack of time. And working with this community demands being in the moment. And, um, and that allows for a discovery of the most exorbitant creativity I have ever witnessed. Um, I, I wonder if there's a space in this conversation for how we can expand more interconnection with artists and scientists in the community to help spark that little C that uh, Nick spoke about earlier of creativity as opposed to the large C creativity, um, and, and emboldening and, and, and enhancing the creativity that each one of us possesses and discovering that for ourselves. Is there a space for us to, to, to help bolster that um, in moving forward? Yeah. And absolutely, I think there is. And, and the, one of the big challenges for arts 
managers always is measuring impact. So you know, the, the sort of work that you're doing, how do we communicate? How, how do we measure it, and how do we communicate it more widely? And I think by by working together to you know research in the arts is actually quite quite a new thing, quite an early thing. And the Arts Council is only 70 years old, so you know there there is so much potential there in terms of us learning about the actual impact of our creativity. And. Uh there's one thing we did, it's just a, an anecdote maybe on this, something we did, we have a, as a Science Foundation Ireland, we host every year a conference, a summit for all our scientists, which is typically for scientists and it's quite scientifically oriented. Um, but over the years we kind of thought that maybe we could introduce something a little bit less sciencey, something more artistic. We, we commissioned a, a poem one year and um, the poet himself came up and there was a video running behind, I'd love to show it to you sometime, it was incredibly powerful. And he goes up in front, on this stage in front of hundreds of scientists and just, you know, performs. You could have heard a pin drop in the room. There was absolute silence, like the moment you described before. He does this thing, and for a, you know, a cohort of people who are there, you know, expecting to hear about you know, quantum chromodynamics or whatever else, uh, to hear this thing happen, to see the video and the imagery that came with it, because it was really audiovisual, the whole impact, the silence and the impact was huge. So there are those ways to carve out those spaces to do that. We'll take the online and then land on the flash, okay? Thanks. Yeah. So from our online participant, uh, could we reframe? some of the perhaps more descriptive language in scientific processes as more emotive experiences to bridge some of the connections with the arts. Mm. Thank you, Anna, for <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Um, I don't know, uh, is the honest answer. I'd have to, yeah, it's something I'd like to explore that question with that person a bit more to understand what they mean by that, but uh, I honestly don't know. I don't know. So then it comes across to you. I mean, look, the problem with science, like anything else, there's a language you have to learn. As in most things, it doesn't matter if you're a lawyer, it doesn't matter if you're a doctor, they all there's a shorthand and a language that we all learn, and science has the same thing. And then each field within science has the mm. same thing. So, you know, it is challenging because it's the only way you can really communicate with peers and things, but it's an interesting question. But, you know, it's back to your uh, comment, Ian, about Beckett and the, the comments and the margins, about finding the beauty in each discipline, about drawing it out, isn't it? Mm. But, yes, but also, I mean, I, I've been obsessively excited about Nora Dredelin, um, <laughs> to the point of driving everyone mad. But I, I, that's okay, be all right. <laughs> I've been obsessively excited about a particular tiny process in the brain, uh, and I still get excited by it. So I do think the emotions are part of the what drives scientific inquiry and curiosity. Last question to Leonard. Yeah. Uh, thanks, folks, and love to talk to Maureen Kieran. Thank you very much. Um, well, you kind of alluded to this, but our education system is a funnel. And you start off in primary school, you learn everything, and by the time you do your PhD, you're, very, you're, you're, you're a, a tall, skinny person. You know, you're very ex expert in one thing. Is there a role for education in, in addressing the kind of inter, 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 interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary type of thing that, that's spoken about today? Because hearing both of you is, is, is incredible, I thought, but, but yet you're, you're in stovepipes. So yeah. does education have a role in how we're, in how we're, in how we're shaping people? Hugely so, and uh, Kieran and I had a, a chat just a few days ago, and preparing for this, and I was relating how um, somebody I met at the weekend was relating how her daughter, who's very very good at art and is 16 or 17, but is unfortunately being discouraged by teachers saying, "Well, look, don't waste your time on NCAD. You know, go out, go off and do something more practical, and then you can always come back to it later." You know, so it's. It's a shame to, to hear that these things are, are still current. So, of course, it absolutely is. You know, but again, you know, that, that is changing. Like We now have an arts and education charter. We're working very closely with the Department of Education through our Creative Schools programme. So it, it's in its early years, but it will, it will have a massive effect. I don't like anything that's an abdication of responsibility to the education system. I think, you know, as, as parents, I've got small kids too. You know, it's partly my job uh, to have that conversation. Look, um, I, we could obviously go on for a lot longer. I just think this has been a, a fantastically interesting discussion. I am thrilled that this was the first time you've been on a panel <laughs> yeah, I together. I hope it will not be the last. Can I, yeah. Martin Canelli, Kieran Oshaga, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And we look forward to seeing you all. Um, we have a Samata session um, or lunchtime because we're as Dominic has designed this, we never talk without tell without showing as well. So there's a show going on, and there's w wonderful other things. Brain FM later on. Um, every day there's the stuff to 
engage in, not just to, 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 not just to listen, brilliant listening, although it's been here. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.